a wee while back now. Uh, and uh, we're going to play that. And then straight after this song, we're going to bring tonight's guest in. So while this song is, is playing, get yourself comfortable and begin to open up your heart to hear what God would say through Pastor David's story tonight. Again, if you have your device beside you, we really value this. It's all we ask of our viewers each week. Please click the share button, get it out there. And it's great to see the number rising again this evening. So this is a song called Good Good Father by Bethany, Naomi and Jimmy. Wow, what a song on 
this Father's Day. And, you know, um, it's great to see hundreds of you tonight again coming in to hear a message of hope of what Jesus Christ can do in a life and what he's done tonight in the story you're going to hear. He can do it for you tonight, dear friend. And, you know, maybe tonight you're sitting and Father's Day has been a bit of a lonely day, a day of struggle, a day of memories that don't bring a, a happy feeling to you. Well, tonight, we're going to hear tonight of a story of how God in heaven knows you and he loves us and he can adopt us as his children and he can become our heavenly father. And so without any further ado, I'm going to bring tonight's guest in, Pastor David, coming all the way from Belfast, the quickest journey he'll ever have to Fermanagh. So let's bring David in tonight. There he is. Hello. Pastor David, can you hear me okay? Yes, can you hear me? Perfect, perfect. And uh, I must say, David, um, I said to you when, when, when I've seen you before, uh, it's, it's lovely wallpaper that we can't afford that stuff down here, you know. <laughs> I don't like it. I want it changed. <laughs> well, David, we really, really are so glad to have you on tonight. It's been a busy day for you. Um, you were preaching tonight already. You had a meeting after the service, and now you're you're on with us tonight. So we appreciate your time. Just tell the folks where are you actually tuning in from there. Where are you where are you at? Uh, this is actually my study uh, here at the Tabernacle in Belfast. So uh, that, that's where we are. We're in this in the, in the study where uh, a lot of the work's done each week. Uh, so yeah, it's comfortable. It's home. It's cozy. Uh, it's a good place. Yeah, very very good. And and what was the weather like today up around the Tabernacle? Glorious, absolutely glorious. Uh, that's 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 a good thing. But uh, sadly, some believers can be encouraged to go to the coast rather mm. than the church. <laughs> Uh, if I had my way, I would have it pouring down on a Sunday. So there's nowhere to go but to go to God's house. <laughs> my wife will tell you, David, I always say to her two things. There's two things as a preacher you don't like on a Sunday. Good weather and bank holidays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but look here, we're so, so glad to have you on tonight. Uh, tell me this, David, have you ever been to a Fermanagh? Have you ever had that blessing? Oh dear, um, as a schoolboy, um, I had a, a school trip to uh, Loch Earn and Devonish Island, where supposedly the prophet Jeremiah is meant to be buried. That's another story. Um, my only other time in, in a skillin for Mana was for the funeral of my wife's uncle, who was murdered in the Inniskillen Poppy Day bombing. It was the only other time I was ever really in Fermanagh. Uh, I came down with Donna uh, for her uncle Sammy. Sammy Gold um, mm -hmm. was just in the crowd that day when uh, oh. that warning bomb went off, uh, Poppy Day Sunday. And uh, so I haven't really been down, no. So maybe you'll invite me down someday and we'll go for fish and chips somewhere and have a good chat together. And mushy, mushy peas, of course, as well. Oh, no, no, not mushy peas. <laughs> not good for the Constitution, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> well, look here. We want to give you as much time tonight to share your story. And so we're going to commit this time to the Lord right now. And uh, there's hundreds listening all across this land and further afield. So we pray tonight, if you're listening live or you'll listen to this uh, later on, that you will be able to to know tonight that what you hear, God can do for you. So let's commit this. Christians, let's pray for uh, Pastor David tonight, and let's commit this time to the Lord. So, Father, we, we just come before you, and we thank you that, Lord, that you're not bound by geography, and you're not bound by anything, Lord. And we thank you tonight that you're able to come to each person who's listening live and in catch-up. And we just pray, Holy Spirit, we ask you, and we just ask you again, will you come close to each person tonight? Show them who the Father really is. Show them who Jesus really is. And Father, we pray you will dispel every lie that the, maybe someone has believed. And I pray tonight, Lord, as they listen to Pastor David, that, Lord, they will know that you're personal, 
and you're able to save them like you have saved David. So God, will you bless our pastor here tonight? Thank you for him. Thank you for his servant heart to come on here tonight and to join with us. And we pray you'll just anoint him greatly in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Pastor David, over to you, brother. God bless you. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, really thank you uh, for the privilege and the honor of being invited uh, to be part of this, what has become a regular event on a Sunday evening. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for asking us to come on and to speak. Well, folks, my name is, is David Purse. Uh, I'm the senior pastor at the famous uh, Whitewell Metropolitan Tabernacle Church in Belfast. It was founded 64 years ago by a 19-year-old uh, Brill Cream kid called James McConnell. Um, he founded the Whitewell Church. Uh, they rented an orange hall. That was their spiritual home for about 12 years. Uh, my father and his brother Charlie were two of the original 10 founding members. So my roots are really, really deep in Whitewell. Uh, somebody has said that if you cut me with a knife, I'll bleed Whitewell all over the carpet. And uh, so Whitewell um, is where I grew up as a boy. Uh, I was born in February 1965. Uh, my dad was called David and my mum was called Anne. Uh, my father is no longer with us. I will talk about that in a moment or two. My mum is still alive and well. And uh, my mum's just unique to me, so precious. And uh, she has a remarkable story herself. When she was born, her mother died in childbirth and her father deserted her. She was reared by her mum's two sisters. And uh, she also uh, came into Whitewell. She was going with my dad uh, when they owned uh, the Whitewell Church. And uh, she's also been here from day one. So uh, our roots really go back uh, into Whitewell's beginnings. So um, I was born in 1965. And life for me was Whitewell. Um, I grew up in a godly home. Mum and dad both loved the Lord Jesus. We went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night. My dad was the superintendent of the Sunday school. And so it was Sunday afternoon. So I had uh, three doses uh, on a Sunday. And uh, but our home was, was a good home. My, my dad worked hard. He was a maintenance fitter in Mitchell's, the tire factory. But because of the troubles in those days, he was also a part-time reserve police officer in the RUC and uh, worked around his shifts. Um, he, when he was on seven to three with the Mitchell's, he would have been on the police Tuesday night, Thursday night, done every, just about every Saturday in life. Uh, and he believed that he was serving his community and endeavoring to keep people safe at what was a traumatic time in our province's history. Um, so I went to church. I heard the gospel week after week. I knew that there was a God. I knew that he had created me. I knew that Jesus Christ was real. He wasn't just a figment in our imagination. He wasn't just a, a fictitious character. Uh, from a book in the fiction section of a library, but he was somebody who was real, that he was God's son, he was born of a virgin, he was sinless and spotless, and he died a vicarious death on Calvary's cross, and he rose bodily from the grave, and he ascended into heavens and has promised that he will return. And I grew up knowing all that stuff. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that I was lost. I knew in my own sea of state if I should die, that I would go to a lost eternity. But my kind of thinking in life was, look, I'm young, I'm a boy. I want to live a bit. And my sort of thinking was, well, when I get my pension book, that's the time to think about eternal things and, and get your eternal uh, business dealt with them. But for now, no, I want to see what's out there when I'm allowed to. I remember one Sunday calling my dad's bluff and uh, we always had an Ulster fry on a Sunday morning before church. And uh, I remember uh, as about 11 year old, 10 or 11, I, I made this tremendous statement. I says, Dad, I'm getting old and older now. And I've decided I'm not going to church. I'll go when I want to. I remember my dad looking up from his soda bread and his, his fried egg and saying, is that right, son? I says, that's right, Dad. I'm not going to church today. And uh, you'll just have to accept that. And he says, well, I'll tell you what I want you to do, David. 
I want you to go up to the front room and go to your, your mum and my bedroom. And on top of the wardrobe, there's a suitcase. I says, yeah. He says, I want you to pack it because you're leaving. I says, what do you mean I'm leaving? He says, well, you're not prepared to abide by the rules of the house. So therefore, you'll have to find another house. So I thought he was, uh, I would I would chance my arm and I would call his bluff. And I said, no problem. And I, I marched up the stairs. I made as much noise as I could going up the stairs. And I hauled the suitcase off the top of the wardrobe. And I expected him at any moment to come running up the stairs and say, now, now David, I was only joking. But he never did. And uh, anyway, eventually I, I packed some clothes and uh, I bounced the suitcase down the stairs behind me and I opened the door and then he opened the door uh, from the living room. And he said to me, he says, David, um, and where are you going? Well, I hadn't thought that far ahead. And uh, I, I says, well, why, Dad? And I was say, waiting for him to say, I thought I was only joking. He never did. And I says, well, Dad, I, I think I'll go and live in Ralph Cool with Granny Purse. He says, that's okay, just so we know where to forward any meal, any post that comes your way. And I realized, uh-uh, I'm the one that needs to back down. And he just said, son, I made God a promise when you were born. Until you were the age of 16, I would be responsible for you. You could make your own mind up after that. But until then, the rules of the house is this. This family loves Christ, and you're going to do things our way. And I must admit, I stormed, and I huffed, and I puffed. But I look back on that, and I thank God for parents who took their stand. And they took God in one hand, and they took their kids in the other, and they said, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And we, he stood by his guns, and I believe God honored him for that. And myself, I'm the oldest of three boys. My brother Mark's three years younger. And Philip, he's, I think, six years younger again. And every one of us today, we love the Lord. We're serving the Lord. We're following the Lord because our parents took God at his word, train up a child in the way that he should go. And that was God's command. And my dad said, I'm going to do that. And he says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And here's God's promise. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. So I grew up in church and uh, I went under protest. But something happened when I was a boy of 13. Uh, I was in the scouts. And, uh, the scouts were attached to the church. And uh, Friday night, we went off to the scouts. And on the Saturday, one of the, the guys helping with the scouts, he organized a, a football match for us vibrant 13-year-olds uh, to play in. And um, I remember his words to me on the Friday night when he dropped me off. He says, David, don't forget, be ready for one o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Be ready. Don't have me sitting outside the house tooting the horn. He says, you be ready. So I was ready to go. Boots were packed and uh, shin guards, the works, and oh, yes, we were going to win today and all the rest of it. One o'clock came, no sign of the minibus. Ten past one, quarter past one, no sign of the bus. Next thing, the door knocked. And it was my friend. And I says, right, where, where's the bus? Are we ready to go? And uh, his name's Ian. And he just says, the game's off. I says, what do you mean the game's off? Robert told us to be ready. He says, David, Robert went home last night and went home and he was shot dead. And this particular guy, before he had come to the Lord himself, had been involved in paramilitaries. And I don't know the story. I'm guessing they thought he maybe knew too much and was frightened that he would grasp and some of his former associates. And uh, that night they got into his house and they shot him dead. The scouts were asked to walk behind his coffin at the funeral. It was either the Tuesday or the Wednesday. And as Providence would have it, I was on the front row. There was the coffin carried right in front of me. And as we walked down the street where Robert lived, a voice in my head and my spirit just said to me, David Purse, if that was you in that box, where would you be? And folks, in a moment, I realized that I had no guarantee of tomorrow. I had no guarantee that I was going to make it to my 50s and 60s. I'm at all the time in the world to 
get right with God. I remember realizing there and then I need to get right with God now. And so that Sunday, I remember going to church and there was only one plan that before the sun set that night that I would give my heart, my life to Christ. And I did that. Pastor McConnell preached the sermon. He made the altar call. I, I couldn't get my hand to go in the air to indicate I was coming to the Lord. And uh, But I went to him afterwards and uh, I remember tugging his coattail as he talked to someone that says, please, Pastor, I need to get right with God tonight. I need to get saved tonight. And he called his associate, a man called James Forsyth, who incidentally had married my mom and dad some years earlier. And uh, and I remember giving my heart to the Lord. I remember this 13-year-old boy kneeling down at this plastic seat in the vestry of the old, old church at the bottom of the Whitewell Road. I knelt down a guilty, hell-deserving sinner, even though I was only 13. But God met me. That night I asked Christ to save me, to forgive me of my sins, to come into my life, to make me a child of God. And, uh, and that was the start of my Christian life. I went to school the next day. I went to Ballyclerk Grammar School and we got the bus. We lived in Glen Gormley in those days and it was a seven mile uh, bus ride to school. And I remember I knew as a, new, as a new Christian, I needed to take my stand right away. All them guys knew what I was like in school. They knew the way I talked. They, they knew the expressions I used. They, they knew what I got up to. I was a rascal. And yet I knew I had to nail my colors to the mast. And I recall a little voice whispering to my ear, if you have any sense, you'll keep this quiet. But I remember what the scripture said, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised them from the dead, we will be saved. So I got off the bus and I waited for my friend arriving on another bus. And I said to him, I said, Gavin, I said, I have something to tell you. Oh, go on. I know what you're like. You're going to tell us about the football game and how many goals you scored, how many people you kicked, stupid. I says, no, Gavin. I says, I need to tell you that last night I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I remember him standing with his mouth open. He dropped his briefcase on the ground and uh, all the school books fell out. And I remember him kneeling down and looking at me as he packed it all back. And he says, you, a Christian? He says, I know what you're like. He says, in the last two weeks. And then he run off into the schoolroom. By the time I got in, he had told everybody that I'd become a Christian. And I walked into this chorus, hallelujah, praise God. And I remember my face going red and I saw the time and it just would have started thumping all around me. And I remember just smiling and says, yeah. I says, I give my heart to the Lord. And them guys put me on trial. They watched every, they listened to every word and they watched every move. And I just said, Lord, you've saved me. Now you're going to have to keep me. You're going to have to give me your grace. Be dead. And you know something? I've been serving the Lord since 1978. I've been loving him. There is nobody like Jesus. He is the greatest person, not just in the world, but in the universe. He's my savior. He's my friend. He has kept me. He has guarded me. He has guided me. He has been there for me, good times and bad. I don't know what I would do without him. I wouldn't want to be without him. And if you could prove to me that Jesus was a figment of the imagination, as far as I'm concerned, there's not much worth living for. He is real. Well, my first trial as a Christian really um, came a few years later. One Saturday, my dad went on duty. It was the 12th of January, 1980. He was detailed to police the football game at Crusaders. Crusaders were playing Portadown. And five minutes before the game finished, a car pulled up and an IRA gunman got out. And my dad was shot dead on the spot. Pastor McConnell had the task of coming to our house and I remember I was in the bath. I was listening to the radio. Uh, my football team was playing, and I was listening to the game on the, on the, in the bath. And I remember this knock at the door. David, you need to get out of the bath. It was my dad's best friend, Tommy Kearns. And I got out of the bath, and I got dressed. And I started to walk down the stairs, and the house seemed silent. 
Do you have any something's going on here? Just then the front door opened and in walked Pastor McConnell with a couple of his colleagues. And I was halfway down the stairs and our eyes met. And he said to his colleagues, you go into the living room there to Anne. That was my mom. I need to talk to David. And he walked towards me on the stairs, met me on the stairs, and he ushered me up the stairs to my bedroom. And a typical teenager's bedroom, football posters on the wall, school books on the floor. And I remember him saying to me, David, you're going to have to be very brave. And he was trembling. I started to tremble. I says, what's wrong? He says, well, David, you know the way your dad was in the place? I says, yeah. And you know he was in duty today? Yeah. Well, David, I'm sorry to tell you, but today he was shot. The next question is, is he still alive? And I remember Pastor McCall telling me, David, I'm so sorry that your daddy was shot to him. He was 43 years of age, trying to protect his community, to play his part, to keep people safe in times of trouble. And I remember I just burst into tears. I cried on Pastor McConnell's shoulder and he cried on mine. And I remember him taking a towel and beginning to dry my hair. And then Tommy Kearns' wife, Jean, came into the room and and it was just, it was a time of just, I thought it was a dream. I thought I'd fallen asleep in the bath. It was just a bad dream and I was going to wake him up. But it was very real. And Dad was gone. I remember that night shaking my fist at God. Yeah, I was angry at God. You see, I believe in the sovereignty of God. And God could have stopped that. But in God's permissive will, he allowed that. And I remember shaking my fist and saying, God, who give you the right to take my dad? But you know, that God kept me. And my mom had done a fabulous job with three boys. She was 37. And her world had just fallen apart. Autumn had fallen out of our world. But on purse to her credit, she took God in one hand and us in the other. And she brought us up. And I want to thank her tonight. I want to say she done a cracking job. In fairness, she had a lot of friends and a good pastor who played their part. My, my dad's brother, Charlie. What an amazing man Charlie Purse is. He's 93. He's still alive. I was talking with him about an hour ago. Charlie Purse and a lot of other people, Tommy Kearns, took me under their wings and stepped in and became a, a, a foster father to me. But when I was 15, just a few months later, I was at church one Monday night, it was the prayer meeting. I was struggling in my faith. I was struggling. I was struggling with feelings of bitterness. I was angry towards those that had killed my dad for their cause. And I remember in this prayer meeting, I just says, Lord, what's the future hold? I was studying. My intention was do O-levels, A-levels, go to Queen's, study medicine. Uh, wanted to work in a hospital. That's what I planned to do. But that night in that prayer meeting, something out of this world happened. Something otherworldly happened. As I sat in that prayer meeting, I'm, I remember starting to feel, it felt as though I was taking ill. I remember the presence of God coming upon me. The heat was unbelievable and then spun. I could feel the weight of this presence coming upon me. It was as though someone had taken a quilt and threw it over. I could feel the weight of this. And I remember we were worshiping at the time and I just said, Lord, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm trusting you with all that I've got. I need you. And Lord, I just, I'm here to tell you that I love you and I want you and I'm here. And I remember that night, it was a prophetic utterance. And if you're not from Pentecostal circles, I don't really expect you to understand that. But if you're from Pentecostal circles, you know what I'm talking about. And that night, it was a prophecy given. My name was mentioned publicly in front of about 300 people. That God's hand was on me. 
that he knew what I was going through, that he was with me, that he had a plan, he had a purpose for my life. And that if I would allow him, he was going to do good things with me, yea, even great things, if I would let him. I remember the service finishing and I remember realizing, you know something, I'm, I'm never, never going to work in a hospital. I know tonight that God has called me, even as a boy of 13, to prepare myself for the day when I would serve him in a full-time capacity. And so Pastor McConnell, aware of what had happened, he was the one that gave that prophetic utterance that night, watched over me, kept his hand on me, guided me, recommended who I should read and what I should be doing. And... Well, I grew up in Waywell, continued to grow in Waywell. I became a Sunday school teacher. I became a, a youth leader. And then I fell in love. I fell in love with a lady called Donna. I remember the very first time I saw her. She was absolutely gorgeous. She was just amazing. I remember looking at her, and she caught me on looking at her. And uh, <laughs> she smiled at me, and I, I remember feeling my face going red, and I looked away. And um, anyway, we, we fell in love. I asked her out. She asked me out of it at the start, and I kind of said no, because I was just recovering from knee surgery. And uh, But uh, I asked her out, and we started going together. Donna is an absolutely amazing woman, and she's one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. We were married when I was 20, and she was 21. I'm her toy boy. And she's my older woman. And uh, we were married. Uh, Pastor McConnell married us August 1985. And then in 1987, I was ordained to the ministry. I went to pastor the church that Pastor McConnell and Whitewell had planted in the town of Newry, just a few yards from the RUC station that had been mortar bombed by the IRA just about a year earlier. And I pastored the Newry Church for two years, and we saw that Newry Church. We saw both Protestants and Catholics coming into that church and hearing the gospel. The gospel is still the power of God on the salvation. I saw people who were alcoholics coming into that church, getting saved, finding Christ, not finding religion, not, not finding uh, Protestantism, finding Jesus Christ. Their lives changed, sins grip on them, broken, and watching them grow in grace. I was in Newry for two years, and then in 1990, I went to Yorkshire uh, to pastor two churches in East Yorkshire. And what was initially supposed to be a two-year appointment turned out to be 18 years. And there, in those 18 years, Donna and I, we reared our three sons, Jonathan and Matthew and Calvin, uh, two of whom love the Lord, still praying for the big lad in Yorkshire, Jonathan, that he'd come to know the Lord, but he, we're so proud of him. He's married a farmer's daughter. When we moved back uh, uh, in 2008, Jonathan stayed, and now he's married, and given us a couple of grandkids, and they're super. Hope to see them in a few weeks' time. And um, I came back to pastor at Collie Becky Elam Church and uh, believed I was going to be there till I retired. And, uh, but God had other plans. And in 2010, Pastor McConnell asked me to come back to Whitewell and uh, to be his associate. And then when he retired in 2014, I became the senior pastor and I've been the senior pastor for seven years. People often say to me, how did you manage to cope with losing your dad and dealing with the bitterness and the hurt? story from the scriptures that helped me immensely and helped me so much was the story of Joseph that's recorded in Genesis chapters 37 through to 50. There was a young teenager of 17, just a few years older than me. He was loathed by his brothers, hated by them. They initially were going to kill him, and then they had another plan. They said, let's sell him to slave traders. And Joseph, if you know the story, was taken to Egypt. He worked on Potiphar's estate. He was a young man who had been hurt, who had been forsaken by his brothers, who probably believed that his dad would turn up and save the day, but dad never appeared. Because unknown to him, Joseph's brothers had told their dad that Joseph had been killed by a savage beast. 
And Jacob, the dad, was allowed to believe that Joseph was dead for 22 years. Well, Joseph put his head down and worked hard on Potiphar's estate. And uh, But Potiphar's wife uh, took a fancy to him. And when her husband was away, she made her clay. But Joseph just said, no, how can we do this great wickedness and sin against God? Well, to cut a long story short, Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of attempting to rape her. And her husband believed her and Joseph was put in prison. Here was a young man hurt again. In prison, he put his head down and worked hard. He told uh, the meaning of the butler and the baker's dreams. The butler forgot all about him. Then one night, Pharaoh dreamed. And Pharaoh dreamed about these seven fat cows and seven thin cows. And then the butler remembered, hey, there's a guy in prison called Joseph, and he interprets dreams, and Joseph was sent for. Joseph was able to tell Pharaoh, God enabling him, that there was going to be seven years of great plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And Pharaoh says, you're the man. You're the man to be prime minister, to prepare for the seven years of famine. And Joseph was made prime minister from the prison to the palace in a matter of hours. Maybe you're listening to me tonight and your life is a tragedy. Your life is just a disappointment. I want to tell you, when you're a Joseph, when you're a David Purse, when you're a child of God, God can turn your life right about round as quick as that. And one morning, Joseph awoke. And he was the prisoner. That night, he was Joseph, the prince, the prime minister, from the prison to the palace. Listen, child of God tonight, God hasn't forgot about you. Do what Joseph did and do what David Purse did in his situation and keep your heart open to God. Don't let your situation make you bitter. Be determined. It's going to make you better. And David Purse could have been so bitter and resentful. David Purse could have joined some organization, got a gun in his hand and went out to exact some revenge. I was not going to allow my father's death to make me better. I says, Lord, I want you to make me better. I want to be a better person because of this. And if you keep your heart open to God tonight, God can take your bitterness and make you better for his honor and for his glory. Joseph had two sons. He married a lady called Asenath, and God gave them two sons. The first son he called by the unusual name Manasseh. I'm sure he was asked, why did you call him Manasseh? And he gave the answer, because Manasseh means God has made me to forget. And certainly, lady tonight, God took David Purse and helped me to forget the pain that I came through. Oh, yes, I still have the memory, very vivid memories. The memory of standing at my father's graveside. The memory of being told he was dead and I'd never see him again, this side of eternity. But God took the hatred and the bitterness and the malice away. God helped me to forget. Joseph then had a second child called Ephraim, which means God has made me to be fruitful. And here's the important lesson to learn tonight, whoever you are who's listening. You will never be fruitful until you learn to forget. And I prayed so often, God, take away this bitterness, this resentment that I have towards people who took my dad's life. And I want to say this tonight. Maybe there's somebody out there and you know my story. Maybe there's somebody out there listening to me tonight and you know who the person is who pulled the trigger that Saturday afternoon in January of 1980. I would love to meet the man who killed my dad. I'd love to meet his gang. I'd love to meet the driver. I'd love to meet the person who sat in the front seat of the getaway car. I'd love to meet them. I'd love to sit down with them. I'd love to tell them about a, about a man that they never knew, but yet they killed. A man who loved Jesus Christ. A man who was a child of God. A man who was a Sunday school superintendent. A man who was an elder and a treasurer in our church. A man that I know I'm going to see again. I want to tell those men about a man called Jesus who forgives sins, 
who takes lives that are ruined. You see, Satan is the thief who comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. Jesus is the one who comes to give life that is abundant, life of a capital L. And I hope I get the opportunity. If those men are still alive today, I'd love them to meet me. I'd love me to meet them. Tell them of one who is mighty to save. You may say to me tonight, well, how can God forgive someone who has blood on their hands? Moses had blood on his hands. Saul of Tarshish had blood on his hands. But they met the Savior. And the Savior was able to forgive and to change and to transform and to make them into vessels of grace. Friend, tonight, maybe you're struggling with memories. Maybe memories, they cast their shadow over your today. Listen, Jesus Christ is the son of righteousness. And he can dispel those shadows. If you're listening to me tonight and you're not seeing, I'm just checking the time. If you're not seeing, you need him. There is nobody like Jesus. He is the only one who can see him. He's the only one who forgives sins. The story is told about the Roman Catholic priest and he was visiting a lady who was a child of God. Her daughter was a Roman Catholic and her mother-in-law was dying and she panicked and she says, I must get my priest to come and you know, give her the last rites. And the priest came in and the dear old lady sat up in the bed and she says, can I help you, young man? And he says, I I'm here to forgive you your sins. And she said to him, show me your hands. And the young priest held out his hands. And she looked at him and she says, young man, you're an imposter. Because the only one that can forgive sins, he's got nail prints in his hands. And certain lady tonight, maybe your life is broken. Maybe sin has done its worst. I want to tell you, there is a savior and his name is Jesus. That Jesus loves you. That Jesus went to the cross and died and shed his blood for your sins. He paid the penalty. He paid a price that you could never pay. That you could be saved. That you could be forgiven. That he would come into your life. That he would adopt you. That you would become a child of God. And that you would be saved. And if he saves, he keeps. He keeps. And I want to tell you tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ has kept me for 43 years. I've given him a million reasons to forsake me. Over those years, I've given him a million reasons to abandon me, to kick me into touch. There's been times I've fallen. There's been times I've made mistakes. But that night he saved me. He invested in me. He made a commitment to me. I'm never going to leave you and I'm never going to forsake you. And if you're really saved, he will keep you till he comes or he calls. Friend, tonight, why don't you trust him? Why don't you call out to him just where you are? Why don't you ask him to save you and to come into your life and to make you his child? I recommend him to me. He's a savior who is mighty to save. He is a keeper who keeps. And he's a Jesus who's coming back. One day there's going to be a reunion when Jesus comes again. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the dead in Christ are going to rise. And I'm looking forward to that day. If there was one place I could be that day, if I was to get a tip off that Jesus was returning in large time, I would jump in the car and drive as fast as I could to Carmony Cemetery where my dad's grave is. I would just love to be there at that moment when Jesus breaks the clouds and the resurrection takes place and the dead and Christ will rise. What a reunion that's going to be. There's going to be some hugging. There's going to be some kissing. Oh, it's going to be amazing. You see, when God died, that was not the end. It was only the end of the beginning. The best is yet to be. Here tonight, you're listening to me. And I'm telling you, there's nobody like Jesus. Why don't you trust him? Why don't you call on him? Why don't you open your heart to him? Why don't you let him in? 
Maybe you've got issues. Listen, there is no situation that he cannot master. There is no person that he cannot save. Listen to what the Bible says. Call on me in the day of trouble and I will answer thee and I will deliver thee and you shall glorify me. Wherever you are tonight, call on him. He's marvelous. He's fantastic. He's tremendous. He's wonderful. I love him tonight and everything that I am and everything I have is because of him. There is nobody, absolutely nobody like Jesus Christ. I'm 56 tonight and he hasn't finished with me yet. I wonder what he's going to do with me still. But every day I get up and serving here on Whitewell, it's a big job. There's a lot of responsibility. There's big calls to make. There's big decisions to make. But every day when I wake him, he has delivered to me a fresh supply of grace. Somebody once said to me, in fact, it was Pastor Stephen Campbell. He said to me one Sunday morning a few years ago, he says, I don't know how you do it. The answer is I don't. But I do it because his grace is there to strengthen me. No matter what trial you're going through, no matter what situation you're facing, his grace can be your strength too. Strength for each day. Pastor David, how do you live? I live one day at a time. I take one day at a time because he gives me the grace for tomorrow. He gives me that grace for tomorrow when I wake in the morning. And we worry about Tuesday when Tuesday comes along. And so friends, tonight it's been lovely sharing this with you. Sharing about my dad who loved the Lord. And I know I'm going to see him again. And God brought me through all that. And whatever you're going through, he can bring you through it as well. Listen, whatever you're going through, don't let it make you better. Be determined by God's strength and God's grace that it's going to make you better. And live for Jesus and serve Jesus in this land and until Jesus comes again. If you want to ever get in touch with us, you can contact us at the Tabernacle. If I can ever help you, just contact the Tabernacle and get in touch with us. And uh, But friend, if you're out there tonight and you're harboring bitterness, listen, I want to tell you something. You're not hurting the people who cause that bitterness. You're only hurting yourself and those that you care about. It's time to get rid of the bitterness. It's time to Forgive those that you perceive have trespassed against you. You know, I just love that part. Jesus makes that little commentary after the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And you know, healing starts by you forgiving. Imagine God would forgive us. Take some of that forgiveness that he has forgiven you with and go and forgive others. Just as his forgiveness has changed your life, let that forgiveness change someone else's life too. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God lead you on with himself. May God use you for his glory. But friend, if you're not saved tonight, let tonight, let this Father's Day be the day when you become a child of God. Let this day be the day when you're saved and your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. On the back to Pastor Nathan. Wow. Pastor David, where on earth do we begin? But I think if you're at home right now, folks, you will be fit to say that those last few minutes have been very powerful, a very special time. And what I want you to do right now is thank Pastor David and uh, Pastor, I would encourage you to go back and read. People are being really ministered to and blessed here tonight. But out of hundreds and hundreds of devices on right now, I know David's heart is to see people come into this relationship with Jesus. They have seen a young lad already tonight at their church commit his life to the Lord. And maybe tonight as you have been listening to David, you know in your heart, I need to have this. I don't have it. Well, Pastor David, would you be willing to lead people right now in a prayer? And if you want to receive Jesus right now, 
You pray in your heart something along the lines of what Pastor David is going to lead, and God will hear it right now. Mm -hmm. And you can be brought from death into life and yeah. have that assurance that Pastor David has and his father had, which he spoke about. So, Pastor, would you be willing to lead people yeah. in a prayer? Amen. So, friend, tonight, if you would love to give your heart to the Lord, let me just encourage you, just, just bow your head. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. We, we just call it here at Whitewell the Sinner's Prayer. And by the way, if you're ever up in Whitewell, call in and pay us a visit sometime. Just remember to wear a mask, socially distance. I joke with our people at the minute, coming to church on Sundays like a bank robber's reunion. That's what it is, but you're very welcome. But friend, if you want to come to the Lord, you pray this prayer. And let me say this to you. See, when you're praying it, put your heart behind it. Mm. With all your heart. Let's pray together. Mm. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the precious name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I come to you tonight, a sinner, a guilty sinner, a hell-deserving sinner. I deserve nothing. But I thank you that I read in the Bible that God is love and God is merciful. Please forgive me tonight of my sins. The sins that people know about, and the sins, God, that only me and you know about. Forgive me of all my sins. Please wash me. Wash me clean in the precious blood that Jesus shed for me on Calvary's cross. And right now, come into my heart. I trust you right now as my Savior and my Lord. Come into my heart. Make me a child of God. Do a work of grace within me. May I be born again from this moment. Give me the grace to follow you and to love you, and to tell others that I love you, and use me for your honor and for your glory. Keep me. Change me. Break the chains that would bind me. Break those things that have a hold on me. Mm. Set me free in you, mm. that I can serve you. Mm. My Lord, my Master, my Savior, my Keeper, my Friend, my Redeemer. Mm. I ask this. In Jesus' precious, precious name. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. And folks, if you have prayed that right now, we want you to confess that. And so why not right now do one of two things? Either drop this page a private message right now, or else drop, if you if you are connected to Whitewell, you know if uh, their page, drop them a message, an email. But get in touch with someone that we can help you on this journey. Tonight mm -hmm. is, as it's been said, Father's Day. No better day than mm -hmm. to know that you are now part of the family of God. Pastor, what, what amazing uh, time tonight. Probably for you, you've shared that many times. For us who are listening to that, a really, really powerful stuff. Really want to zone in tonight, folks. If you're harboring that bitterness, Look, uh, let that bitterness uh, be dealt with tonight. The Lord can help you with that, as Pastor David said. David, two, two quick things before you go. I know you've got a journey to get back home. Uh, firstly, is this, uh, many Christians are, I think, a bit deflated, feeling like evil's infiltrating uh, our, our province and our, and our land. Do you still believe there's hope, David? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, our land is in a mess. Our, our world is in a mess. Mm. Uh, society is in a mess. Society is broken. Uh, you ask me, what's the answer? That's very, very simple. Jesus, every time, mm. is the answer. Mm. Uh, we need him to come again and set up his kingdom. But until then, mm -hmm. the church has a job to do. But I need to remember, and you need to remember right now, that God is for us. Mm. Don't forget that. God is for us. He's for me. He's for Pastor Nathan. He's for his people. Our God is for us. Yes. It doesn't matter who else is for us. As long as God is for us, mm. that's all that matters. And our God is for us. Mm. Our God hasn't finished with us. Mm. Our God has yet to start with us, I think. And we need his people. 
all over Northern Ireland and even into the South of Ireland, God has his people. We haven't bowed the knee to be on. God's people need to get together. Listen, pastors need to get together. Pastors need to answer Christ's prayer. When Jesus prayed in John 17, that my people might be one. Did you know that that's the only prayer of Jesus that has never been answered yet? And yet God's people are the people stopping that prayer being answered. It's time for us to forget what divides us and concentrate on what unites us. If you are born again, if you are blood washed, if you are Bible believing, I don't care if you're a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Pentecostal or whatever. If you're a child of God, you're my brother, you're my sister, and we need to get together. And God's servants need to wise up and stop squabbling and bickering and fighting like a crowd of old women. And I'm sorry, I don't want to be disrespectful to the elderly women. And <laughs> we need to wise up and get together and serve the Lord. Since people are united, it's time for the people of God to get united. Hmm. And my goodness, if we are united, he has promised in Psalm 133, there he will command the blessing where there's unity among his people. Mm. So church, don't get discouraged. Church, we're coming at a pandemic. I trust and I pray. People are saying, what's the church going to be like? I, I don't know, but I'm determined. I'm not just going to survive. I want Amen. to thrive. Amen. Just survive, thrive. And why do we thrive? Because our God is for us. Mm. Remember that tomorrow. God yes. is for us. The angels of heaven, the hosts of heaven are for us. Yes. Or who's against us? Yes. And they, because he's with us, we're more than conquerors. Mm. Amen. Amen, David. David, you're only getting going and it's 10 o'clock, so it is. You're getting fired up here. But you know, David, when you get that, when you get that and you remind yourself of it and stop listening to the lies of the devil in our minds saying the church is finished and all of this rubbish, and to know that there's still people praying all over this land and there is going to be a great Amen. harvest. Amen. And uh, I pray that that will be in the country here in Fermanagh. It will be in the city in Belfast. And there won't be a place that will not experience uh, a touch of the glory of God. Now, David, I've got to ask one last question before you go now because uh, – uh, my, my best friend is a, is a big cricket fan, and uh, I'm not a cricket fan, but I seen behind you, David. Oh, there's a dear. there's a, a cricket bat yeah. up behind you. What are yeah. you a cricket fan? Oh my goodness, uh, it's my second religion. <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge cricket fan. Lived in Yorkshire and follow Yorkshire, and that cricket bat uh, that was the year that Yorkshire won the county championship. And uh, it's signed by all the Yorkshire team that year. Mm. Uh, uh, God willing, um, COVID permitting, I'm going over to Yorkshire in a few weeks' time. Yorkshire's playing Lancashire, the Roses. And me and my three sons, we have got tickets for day two and day three, uh, Yorkshire against Lancashire. And I'm praying for good weather. <laughs> and, uh, we'll, we'll see the white rose of Yorkshire triumph over the red rose of Lancashire. And it's the 12th and the 13th of July. And uh, Pastor Michael Bunting here at Waywell, he says, God forgive you going away to watch cricket on the 12th of July. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, but yeah, that's what the cricket bat's about. Uh, Joe Root signatures on it, Johnny Bairstow, all England players. And uh, I'm going to wait for a lot of years and, uh, and then I'll auction it and uh, make a few pounds out of it. <laughs> very good. That, that, that is quite the story. So that, that bat is very significant. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> there you go. My, my, so, son, my son in England actually got me it. Jonathan got me it, so he did. Uh, so all the, all the whole Yorkshire squad signed it, and uh, so it's on, the, it's on the wall there behind me. There you go. Well, look, David, I know you have a journey to get back home, so we really appreciate that, folks. Uh, and I hope uh, you've been really blessed. Now, can I just say once again, if tonight you have gave your life to Jesus, or maybe you want more help with it, get in touch with us. Don't keep it to yourself. Reach out to someone tonight. We'll be back on live again Tuesday night, 9 p.m. We'd love you to join with us. And for tonight, once again, Pastor David, God bless you. And God bless the Whitewell Church and all uh, that you guys are doing for 
the Lord and his kingdom. So good night. And I'm going to leave you with a song uh, for tonight. And I uh, will see you all again very soon. to the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for